And then if you do have any uh, questions that come up throughout the presentation that are relevant to any given section. So for example, Brian's gonna talk a little bit about the financials this year. So if you have questions about the financials, um, please put up your hand. And to do that, you can go down to that bottom black bar, the navigation bar where you have your mute and your stop video. And just on the far right before the end button, you'll see a reactions button. If you click that, there's an option there to click raise hand. And that will put a little raised hand by your name. And that way we know that you have a question. So if you do have a question, feel free to raise your hand. I'll then call on you and then you can unmute yourself and ask your question or make your comment or whatever that is. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Kayla and Brian to do the raffle. Hey. Okay, Kayla, you're muted. Excellent. I'm going to uh, share my screen um, while I do the raffle. So it's all done online, which is through we're using Raffle Nexus. And I'm going to press a few a few buttons here. So we've um, we can make a drum roll. <laughs> so basically, we go next. And we're making sure everything's ready. Next. And there's only one, one person that's going to win this prize. So our available prizes are one. We have 368 eligible tickets. And I will press start drawing and it will draw us the name that is our winner for our 50-50 raffle and is taking home $920. Dun, 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 dun. Won't take long. <laughs> draw ended successfully. Ticket number 110306. S. White, Courtney, BC. So that person I don't believe is with us tonight. And uh, they will be contacted via email and I will be announcing this on our Facebook page as well. So congratulations to S. White from Courtney, BC. You're taking home $920. Thank you very much for supporting our 50-50 raffle. Ooh. And I will stop screen sharing. Oops, stop share. There we go. Over to you, Kathy. Okay, thanks, Kayla. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the AGM for 2022. And uh, uh, to begin with, in case people don't know who some of us are, I'd like to introduce the board who are present and the staff as well. I'm Kathy Haig, the acting chair for the board of directors. And next is Brian Story. Give us a wave, Brian. And Alicia Drinkwater. Hi. Hello. And Dawn Castleton. Hello. And Bill Heath is here tonight. Hey, Bill. And Pat Sloan has joined us. Hey, Pat. We do have other directors, but these are those who are with us so far this evening. And uh, two of our staff are currently online with us, as you've already met, Kayla Holbrook and Caitlin Perchelski. So thank you everyone for, uh, for being here. And uh, a big thank you to all of our volunteers. And uh, I see that we, we have some very key volunteers here. And congratulations to Ellen. I understand you won uh, one of the art draw tickets and went home with a painting for a $20 fee. That, yeah, was, that was a pretty good deal. <laughs> awesome deal. Yes. Yes. And uh, yeah, so I, you know, we really appreciate our volunteers and all of our supporters. So thank you all for, for being here and for everything you do for us. Uh, just a brief outline of our program for this evening. We're up next is going to be Brian Story giving a treasurer report. Then we'll have elections, which will be facilitated by Betty Donaldson. And um, Kayla and Caitlin will be doing a summary of our work over this, over this past year. And then we'll have a motion to accept the 2021 minutes of the 2021 AGM minutes. And following that will be a special presentation by Dr. Deborah Giles on uh, the wild orca research that she's been doing. Sure. Sure. So I think it's, is it back to, uh, I guess we're straight over to Brian for the treasurer report, Brian. I made a brief report on the assumption that 
And those people who wanted to read the financial statements have read the financial statements. <clears throat> Need to have a drink. Thank you. I'm sorry, I have my throat. I'm going to read a brief report to highlight uh, the statement for those of you who haven't digested it completely. Our statement of operations shows $125,000 excess of revenue over expenditures, and that represents grants and community donations received but not yet expended on projects or operations. You know, we are a not for profit organization, so it's a go through situation. As well as the Cusco Sum Initiative, Project Watershed continues to be busy fulfilling its mission of community stewardship for the protection and restoration of our watersheds. During the year, we received over $934,000 from federal and provincial environmental agencies and $860,000 from foundations dedicated to the welfare of the environment. We also received over $250,000 from the community, and for that we are thankful. In turn, we applied most of it, $1.2 million, to the restoration of the Cusco Sum site. The additional 600,000 of our expenditures was used for other projects in the Valley that you'll be hearing about later on. Most of these expenditures went to persons and companies present in the Comox Valley and Vancouver Island. Caitlin and Kayla will elaborate on the working projects that were carried on during the year. Well, that, those are the highlights, and I think maybe all most of you want to hear about from a financial point of view, but I will ask if there are any questions arising from the financial statement. Uh, seeing or hearing none, I need to ask, please, if I may, a motion from the floor and the seconder to accept the financial statements as presented. Thank you, Don. And the seconder. So moved. Thank you, so Betty. Seconded. Uh, all those in favor, please just raise your physical hand. Thank you. I see none opposed, but it's carried. Thank you. <clears throat> my final uh, point, uh, my motion has to do with the appointment of a CPA firm to act as the uh, uh, outside accountants for our company. And I propose that we appoint Chan Noasad Boats, who have done the review now for the past three years, to hold office as independent accountants until the next annual general meeting. Now for that, I also need a motion and a seconder, please. Thank you, uh, Pat and Kathy. Um, all those in favor, please raise your, your physical hand. Thank you. Um, and that is my oversight. Um, for those of you who haven't read the financial statements, uh, please do because you'll find the notes to the financial statement very informative uh, and um, well worth well worth your reading. Uh, the actual numbers themselves uh, they're interesting to me, but overall, of course, uh, they may be boring compared to what you're going to hear shortly. But do please take the time to read the notes of the financial statement if nothing else. And thank you very much. I'll turn it back to Kathy. And over to Betty, I guess. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Gayla Kessel, I raise my <laughs> hands to the people who are so consistently volunteering for the Project Watershed Board. That kind of stability has built this organization into one that has a profile far above the membership level, but the impact on the community is well known and is sustained. So thank you to all of those of you who continue to serve as directors. We have nominees for the um, the uh, election for the forthcoming year, which is 22-23. There is a protocol to follow. Um, Kayla said that I didn't need to list the board members who are standing for election, but I would like them to, oh, well, I guess we won't see them, but you'll see their names there and maybe they'll lift their, their raise their hand. I think everyone's here. I don't know if Dan Bowen is. I think everyone else is present. Yeah, Dan Bowen is not present. Okay, and so I must ask three times if there are any other nominations. Second call for nominations. Are there any other nominations from the floor? Um, yes, I nominate Tim Annis. Oh, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy. Is he present tonight? 
No, not yet. But he has he has accepted that he would be um, he would be willing to stand for election. Um, I have. Is there anyone who has an objection to the addition of this name? Let me ask: Is there any limitation to the number of directors? So no, no, can, the, the directors uh, we can have up to fifteen directors, Betty. So there we are. We'll simply add this name, Tim Ennis, to the list. Tim is well known to all of us, and I think that's strengthening an already strong board. So for the third time, I am calling from any other nominations from the floor. Hearing no other nominations from the floor, I'm asking if there are any objections to this wonderful list of uh, directors. Hearing no objections, would everyone please join me in a clap because we are now electing the people that are named here plus Tim Ennis. Thank you, all of you. Please everyone, let's clap, rub your hands, raise your hands. We're very grateful to this board. Thank and you, my job is now finished for the year and I pass it over to, I believe, Caitlin. Perfect, thanks Betty. And thank you to our board members. It's been a pleasure working with you for the past year and I look forward to doing it for another year. So thank you. Um, so I'm gonna jump right into project updates. Uh, so if you do have any questions as I'm cruising along, please let me know. I believe Kayla, you're also gonna show a little bit of a slideshow as we go. So hopefully I can stay on subject here. All right, perfect. So firstly, of course, we'll talk about our flagship project, which is Couscousum. So this is our sawmill restoration project. Last year was a full one at the Couscousum site. Copcan Civil LTD was the successful bidder for our tender to do the concrete and asphalt removal, which was a huge project. They were removing um, over 8.3 acres of hard surfacing. So with their help, we were able to unpave the area, all except a small portion just near the south gate, which has been left for parking and staging. Due to the sheer uh, amount of concrete and asphalt on the site, we did this in stages. The first and most intensive stage was the removal of the surface concrete, and that occurred over the summer of 2021. The concrete was laden with rebar, which was removed, trucked off site, and recycled. The concrete was crushed and removed from the site, and uh, all of this concrete was repurposed to different developers, businesses, and individuals, and it was used in local projects as road base and structural fill. Um, during this stage, most of the asphalt was also removed as well. As we pulled up concrete from the surface, we found more concrete underneath that. So um, during a second stage, we started to do the subsurface concrete removal. This was initiated in around October, but because of a lot of the um, really poor, really rainy weather we got around that time of year, we had to postpone that work until the early spring. So work was halted and the site was prepared for overwintering. Um, and then at that point, the remainder of the subsurface concrete, um, including a big long concrete wall, which we discovered that was just on the inside of the steel piling wall. So all of that was um, excavated out, dug out, and then crushed. And that all happened in February and March of this okay. year, which was 2022. So then after that, all the hard surfacing was removed from the site. All of it was repurposed. It was about 12,000 cubic meters of concrete, which is pretty incredible. Um, there was also some other utilities and subsurface utilities that we found. For example, this PVC piping, which I believe was repurposed uh, by the Cumberland Mountain Biking Club. Um, so it's used for drainage on trails, which is really cool. Um, and then when we got to March, we were also able to um, recontour and plant a small section of the site, which was great. This is myself and Kayla at that section of the site. Um, and we were able to plant over 400 plants in just under two days, which is incredible. So we had the help of over 30 volunteers and we had the entire site planted, mulched, we had a wonderful elder out who welcomed us to the site and gave a little bit of uh, site history as well, which was beautiful. And uh, so that was the big effort that happened for this year. It was a lot of hard surfacing removal and that little bit of pilot planting. 
So the other part that was kind of happening in the background of all this was a lot of baseline monitoring. Um, so we were collecting, collecting data from the Hollyhock Flats Conservation Area, which is our reference site for Couscousum. Um, and so we had a focus on fish and wildlife and vegetation for all of those monitoring efforts. And those monitoring efforts will continue throughout the years as we restore Couscousum. So our funding support for the past years was from FWCP, HCTF, WWF, BC Schrift, Pacific Salmon Foundation, and Healthy Watersheds Initiative, as, lo as well as many community and business supporters. So thank you for everyone for that. For a full funding overview, you can see our website. Um, and next, I believe we'll move on to Coastal Restoration Fund. So we had a very successful year as well with coastal restoration. Um, we were wrapping up our coastal restoration fund projects. So that was a five-year fund that ran from 2018 to 2022. The coastal restoration fund, um, it funded many of our projects with a focus on salt and tidal marsh restoration, eelgrass restoration, kelp restoration, as well as extensive coastal monitoring and planning. So Jennifer Southerst, our senior staff biologist, has updated the Coastal Restoration Plan for 2022, and that is up and available on our website. Um, in collaboration with Angela Spooner, one of our contractual biologists, we transplanted about 1,000 square meters of eelgrass at Miracle Beach. We also did a lovely tide marsh platform um, planting and construction in the Comox Estuary, which you can see as you're driving up Comox Road, which is great. And then the main focus for this year was really to wrap up all of the monitoring, um, all of the reporting that happened for projects over that five year period. So that's what you're doing. And what you're seeing here on this lovely slide is some of the Carex transplants that went into that tide marsh planting. Um, so we also undertook uh, a Green Shores project. So we are starting a feasibility study for a Green Shores project that will be happening in collaboration with the Pacific Salmon Foundation, the BC Stewardship Center, and the CBRD. And that will be at the Rotary Viewing Stand. So that's still in the preliminary stages. We've finished the feasibility study and the budgeting for that project. Uh, but the work is still currently in planning stages and the restoration works will likely be taking place in 2023, 2024. So stay posted for more information about that one. And then what you're, here, you're seeing here um, on the slide is some of the restoration work that we undertook in the Glen Urquhart watershed this year. So this is actually on the Comox Bay Farms property. So in August of 2021, we were able to use a excavator to remove a lot of reed canary grass that has infested the area. Um, so the reed canary grass was buried on site. We did an experimental burial of the reed canary grass using a thick parchment to cover it. So we'll, um, we're monitoring that work and we're seeing how it goes. Uh, we also found some, there's an example of it, which is great. And then you basically plant right through some of the parchment and then mulch over top. And this stops it from growing back in. So uh, we did a lot of invasive species removal. We restored an ephemeral wetland within that area. And then we also did a little bit of restoration for some um, rare plant species that are found there. Um, in this case, it was for the Van Vancouver Island beggar ticks, which is great. Um, we're also working on a future plan for this area, which will include some in-stream works and also some rare plant community restoration. In, the, in our work in the Mallard Creek, which you're seeing here, um, we live staked a section of the creek that we had cleared of reed canary grass, which had overgrown the stream. Um, the willows are doing quite well, um, and they managed to survive the heat wave and extensive deer browsing, which is great. Um, and then we'll be doing um, a little bit more work in that watershed again this year. And then for our forage fish project, you can see here some uh, some uh, Pacific sand lance eggs, which is great. So some of the um, some of the big highlights for this year is that we found some uh, Pacific sand lance eggs at Tree Island, um, and those were found with the help and support of the Comox First Nations Guardians um, at Curtis Beach, one of our blitz sites, um, and the focus of our forage fish habitat assessment. Uh, we found 
many eggs over the year, and eggs were also found on Kai Bay, Goose Spit, and Air Force Beach. Um, this was the third year of a three-year funding cycle for this project, and over those three years, we established eight core beaches, um, and those include Cortez Island, on or Cortez Island, which is Manson Landings. There's two sites there and one at Smelt Bay. There's a Quadra Island site at Rebecca Spit. In Campbell River, one of our core sites is Frank uh, James Park and Oyster Bay Shoreline Park. There's um, a couple sites in the Comox Valley here, including Air Force Beach and Goose Spit, which is three sites. And then there's one site on Hornby Island at Shingle Spit. So we've also established 35 blitz sites and those are monitored, monitored approximately once a year each. This project has had an extensive partnership component. So there's been leadership from Environment and Climate Change Canada, the province of British Columbia, the University of Victoria, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, including uh, Cliff Robinson and Beatrice Proudfoot, uh, Jacqueline Bars at WWF, and many other folks, a huge community of supporters and volunteers who've been monitoring for forage fish throughout the past three years. Uh, we also have some academic collaborations with Jack Huard at, uh, at UBC, Nicola Houtman at UVic, and then also Will Do Good at UVic as well. And then the person you see here is one of our lovely OceanWise Ocean Bridge volunteers. Her name is Tierra Jacobson, and she joined the project for three months this year to help us out with field support. She braved the weather and pre-filtered our eDNA samples for the, from the past three years, which has allowed us to expedite some of that sampling. So um, that project was brought to you by the happy and proud support of the BC Salmon Restoration and Innovation Fund, the Pacific Salmon Foundation, and also with thanks to the Comox Valley Regional District. Great. So I think those are our main project updates for the year. Um, Kayla, can I pass it over to you now for your education and outreach updates? Caitlin. Um, so let's just go ahead here. We had a great year for taking kids out. We've been able to resume our keeping it, students keeping it living uh, in the Comox estuary, which has been lots of fun. We've taken over 250 kids out on field trips uh, during April, May, and June, um, ranging from grade one to grade five. Um, we've also worked with a grade seven class who's cut out um, in their woodwork class they cut out a bunch of the wooden salmon that these were in Cumberland Elementary. And then again, the Cumberland students, the younger students got to paint them as part of the program. So our program works that we go in and do a presentation um, on the estuary and watersheds and couscousum. And then we go out um, to one of the sites that we have and we go through it. Sometimes with the little kids, we pretend we're salmon and we, we look at the different habitats and, and how they work well with uh, and how they support salmon and other creatures in our um, environment here. And that's a picture of me with some grade uh, threes, I think. And we're looking at salt marsh and how thick the the roots are that hold the salt marsh and, and that gets all that nutrients gets um, sec uh, secured there by those salt marsh plants. And they couldn't, the test is to see if they can get their fingers inside and none of them can. So they can really get a sense of how thick and dense that mat is and how important it is. Anyways, it was went really well. And um, after we do the field trip, then we go back and paint salmon. So here's a picture of uh, Brooklyn Elementary and some salmon salmon painting. Everyone gets really into it, and we talk about what we what we learned and and how what they're doing is helping restore couscousum. We often play a game salmon versus seals, where we have a tarp and they run up and down the tarp like tag, and uh, they've got salt marsh they can hide in from the seals that are the ones tagging the salmon. And then we take the salt marsh away on one side and they have to play the game again and they get a really good sense of uh, what it's like for the salmon going by that that wall both out migrating and in migrating salmon so they have lots of fun with that and i think we we all learned something oops wrong button just a second do, 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 do. the quick version okay 
And then continuing on into our community, we have uh, it's been great being out in the community again and seeing everyone. Um, Ken and Nana once again this year donated 50 pieces of art and we were able to hold our fundraiser paintings by the numbers. It went very well. It was lots of fun. All we sold out our tickets. And we actually had a couple requests for more tickets at the last moment. The Comox Valley is like that. We, we sold our all out on, I think, Thursday and then Friday before the event, people were asking for more tickets. And um, so that went really well. And Ken and Nana were able to be there this year, which was great. We raised, uh, so the event raised about $26,000. It was uh, sponsored by Audlem Brown. And this is Jenny Martin right here. She attended the event and uh, she kind of, um, is that she's from Audlem Brown and she we have a really good relationship with Audlem Brown and they've supported this event in the past and we're very appreciative to them. 40 Knots uh, donated this space and uh, Hot Chocolates even donated some hot chocolate sand dollars for our little uh, snack packages. So that went really well. Um, also this year we did our air park planting. So we went to the air park with a bunch of volunteers and it's amazing the change that we've been able to make here. We've been working at this site year after year for hmm, five or six years now. And we can really see when we first got there, there was so much blackberry, um, all invasives along the side here. This is the air park. So many invasives here. We were going at it with uh, weed eaters and uh, whatever we could. And, and now that we've been at it so many years, it's really kept down and we're able to see our native plants doing well in this area. So that's uh, very successful. And it's lovely for our volunteers who come out every year to see the progress. Um, we also did a shoreline cleanup this year. We did a huge shoreline cleanup. cleanup. Um, so we did it both with um, Project Watershed staff as well as a volunteer component. Um, and there's some of our intrepid volunteers out with uh, their family. And uh, we had a lot of families join this year, which was really great. Um, out And everyone took a section. So instead of doing one, clean up at one location we managed to do all the way from Little River Ferry down to just about um, Fanny Bay. So we've had lots of people along the way and it really allowed us to get a large percentage of the shoreline cleaned up, which was excellent. And uh, we put out some new e-cards. They're on our website. If you want to congratulate someone or say thank you or happy birthday, they're there for you. Um, it's done through Canada Health. We had our Keeping It Living dinner in September, which went extremely well. We changed it up a little bit here and uh, we went around and got everything donated. I think 90% or more of all the ingredients were donated from different uh, producers here in the Comox Valley. And Stephanie, Stephanie, Noel and Yolanda, they were the chefs that con contributed their time. So they um, contributed their time to create the delicious dishes and it went really well. And we also had a, a fun time. We took some kids to the couscous and fence and we talked about uh, truth and reconciliation and they helped me tie up some tags along the fence um, as our way of just thinking about and, and um, uh, truth and reconciliation and this project and how it all works together. And we had uh, some, as Caitlin said, we've had such amazing support from our community over the year. And this is um, one of the families who's really supported us and we're, we're very appreciative and we're, we're so happy to be a part of being able to remember people like Micah um, and doing good work like uh, the, the Couscousum Project. Oh, and that is the end of my section. Thank you very much. I'm gonna pass it on now. I think Caitlin's going to, oops. Caitlin is going to um, be able to introduce our, our speaker for tonight, which I'm really excited about. Great. Yes. Thanks, Kayla. And uh, yeah, thanks to everyone for joining us and for supporting the work throughout the past year. And then today, I'm very excited to introduce our speaker, Dr. Deborah Giles. She is one of the world's leading experts on Southern resident killer whales. She started as a research assistant in 2005, and then Southern resident killer whales were the subject of her graduate studies and her entire professional career since receiving her PhD. This makes her one of the few scientists that have focused almost exclusively on this iconic population through the focus of her career. Uh, Dr. Deborah Giles serves as the research director for Wild Orca, Orca sorry, and as a research scientist at the University of Washington, 
where she monitors the southern resident killer whale's health through non-invasive sampling. So thank you so much, Deborah, for joining us. I will pass it over to you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, that was really interesting to watch the presentation there um, and uh, be have an opportunity to see all of the amazing work you guys are um, spearheading or involved in. So kudos to all of you. Wow. Um, so I think I'll just jump right in if that works. I have a PowerPoint presentation to share. Um, Great, I've made you a co-host, so you should be able to share your screen now. Okay. Can you see that? Can Can everybody see that? Yeah, yeah I can see it. I can see it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, when I have this PowerPoint presentation up, I can't see any of you guys. So <laughs> you guys could all split and I wouldn't know. <laughs> So um, I love uh, the orca dog. Yeah. Um, so uh, I am. Uh, I just go by my last name as a, a in honor of my dad, who was a huge supporter of all of his kids, and um, he did not live long enough to see me fulfilling my dream <laughs> for the seven resident killer whales. But um, I do think about him every day, and uh, when I hear uh, introduce myself to people, it's just as our last name. So. Um, Anyhow, I, uh, I am the science and research director at Wild Orca. I also teach a class at the Friday Harbor Labs, which is a satellite ca um, campus for our main University of Washington campus, which is in Seattle. We have a satellite campus here on San Juan uh, called Friday Harbor Labs, and it's over a hundred year old lab. Um, so there's long, long term research that's been occurring there, including um, forage fish. Uh, and um, and habitat uh, for forage fish in the in the San Juan Islands and our other neighboring counties. So um, I sure hope we can all, as a broader uh, Salish Sea ecosystem, do something about um, the decline, massive decline in forage fish. So thank you guys for doing your part up there. So um, this uh, uh, handsome creature is my dog Eba. She's a a uh, rescue dog that was found on the streets of Sacramento, California um, back in 2015. And we trained her up to be a scat detection dog in 2019. So uh, our program is called the Southern Resident Killer Well Health Monitoring Program. And I'll talk uh, quite a bit about that in a little bit. But first I'll give a kind of a little uh, Killer Well 101. So our study area is uh, shown essentially in the map on the left of the Salish Sea. So we have expanded our program uh, out to the Strait of Juan de Fuca, the, um, the west entrance of the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And, um, and actually our new research permit uh, allows us to go all the way down uh, following the whale's uh, entire range, which is all the way down south to uh, just south of Monterey, California to Big Sur or Point Sur. And uh, so, but mainly we are stationed right here on San Juan, the, uh, which is at the heart of the San Juan Island archipelago. And um, we uh, operate out of the west side of San Juan Island. So uh, this area is an incredibly interesting uh, area bath uh, bathmetrically. Um, it was, this whole region was carved out by glaciers and so ends up providing an amazing array of different habitat for salmon and so, uh, in the past, when the, there was a lot of uh, salmon going up the Fraser River, uh, the southern resident killer whales were here almost every day between mid-May and the end of October. Uh, and by here, I mean in the Salish Sea, so not just around the San Juans, but up into the southern Gulf Islands as well. So we do have many different species of, of whales uh, and uh, porpoise and pinnipeds in the Salish Sea. Our study is now expanded not only to the fish eating killer whales seen here in the top left, but also to mammal eating killer whales who, uh, as their name suggests, only eat mammals. Um, and then now also humpback whales, gray whales, and minke whales. And we're collecting fecal samples on those other uh, groups because it can give us a broader idea about what's happening in the ecosystem. So who are the Southern resident killer whales? Um, probably everybody on this Zoom is uh, intimately uh, aware of who they are, but um, just as a quick recap, there's one clan that are connected by a, uh, their dialect. 
Um, so the, the one clan, the Southern Resident Killer Whale community is made up of three pods, J pod, K pod, and L pod. And in total, there are only 74 or 75. And we're a little bit um, on the fence about whether it's 74 or 75, because there's uh, a good possibility that we've lost one of our breeding age males. And uh, we're just waiting for his family to come back into the inland waters uh, to see whether or not they are still without him. So the uh, common tradition is to wait for three encounters with a family without an individual uh, present before we make the um, final determination that that individual is gone. So I'm, I'm hopeful that he'll be uh, found that LPOD male when his family comes back, but um, I actually don't think so. So that would put us at 74 with the birth of a, a new baby a couple of weeks ago. So our study, uh, again, mostly focuses there on the orange part, which is the summer core critical habitat of the Southern residents in US and Canadian waters uh, designated in Canada before we got around C Canadian, you Canadians, thankfully, um, uh, designated this population of animals uh, on your in equivalent of our endangered species list, the Sarah uh, list, the Species at Risk Act list. And uh, you folks uh, were uh, ahead of the curve there and uh, designated them in 2001. It took us until 2005 to designate these guys as an endangered species or an endangered population. We finally got around to it in 2005 and um, quickly determined and set aside critical habitat uh, as you see there in orange. And then it took all the way until almost the end of last year uh, for the outer coast critical habitat to be designated. And you can see that in green. So this is an incredibly interesting population of animals. They are, uh, uh, they do have culture. We see the, these cultural traditions passed on from, from mother to offspring. Um, they are an, a unique population of animals on the planet because both males and females stay with their mother their entire life. And when she dies, the adult males will um, attach themselves to their oldest sister um, and then the, the pods are made. So for example, J-pod has six matrilines made up of, of the oldest females in that immediate family line. So that's really rare in the, in, in the uh, animal kingdom and certainly in the mammalian world where you have both males and females staying with their mother their entire life. Um, and uh, uh, it's one of these chicken and egg things which came first, but they do not eat anything except what their mom taught them how to eat. And so that's why we have a population of animals that are obligate fish eaters, very, very um, uh, focused uh, on the biggest of the Chinook salmon, the, the um, uh, uh, Chinook or King salmon, um, even though there's ample marine mammals in these waters that they could catch and eat, but they just don't because mom didn't, didn't teach them to do that. So this shows one of their really unique uh, uh, behaviors called kelping. They uh, purposely go out of their way to uh, interact with and play in kelp beds. Um, the big picture on the left is a picture of what is thought to be the oldest killer whale on the planet. She passed away in 2016, but this is her um, swimming just right offshore at Lime Kiln State Park um, at, on San Juan Island, rolling around in kelp beds. And it took her about 45 minutes to roll past about, oh, I don't know, maybe 300 meters. Uh, just having uh, what seemed like a, um, a kelp spa. So just to, I just show you this to um, start to paint the picture of who these animals are as individuals. So as I mentioned, these guys are obligate fish eaters. They co-evolved with Chinook salmon um, up and down the west coast of the United States and up into BC waters. Uh, J-Pod has been documented in Southeast Alaska one time, that was in uh, 2007. Basically, they stay uh, about midway up Vancouver Island and south of that, um, because as you probably know, the um, northern part of Vancouver Island is the territory of the northern uh, fish eating resident killer whales. And uh, while they um, are very similar in their uh, way of making a living and, and their natural history and that they only eat fish, they stay with mom uh, for their entire life, both males and females. Southern residents and Northern residents do not intermingle. They don't speak the same language. And when they uh, come upon each other in, in, the, you know, in the water, they uh, seem to avoid each other. 
Um, so that's pretty interesting considering they, they could mate and have viable offspring, but they just don't. Um, so this is a picture, the one on the right um, is a picture of, again, uh, J, J2, other, otherwise known as granny. Um, I, I think of this picture as one of the most beautiful and heartbreaking pictures I've ever seen of these guys, because this is her towards the end of her life. She was most certainly starving, not having enough to eat, and yet she spent a tremendous amount of time uh, uh, trying to teach her great grandson, J45, how to catch fish. This is a fish here that you can see, and um, she was successful in herding that fish towards J45 long enough for him to catch it and consume it. He actually shared it with her, which they are also known to do, capture and then prey share. His mom, uh, J14, died earlier in the year. And so J2 spent a lot of the last moments of her life making sure that he knew how to, how to successfully forage. And I'm happy to say that he is still in the population and seems to be doing fairly well. So the southern residents, as I mentioned, are on the endangered species list in both countries. They are the only population of killer whales on our endangered species list. And so are so much of their prey. When they were listed in 2005 in this country, the main identified threats to this population were lack of prey, both in quality and quantity, um, the vessel presence and associated noise. So you can see J27 here swimming in front of a massive deep sea container ship. These are ships that, um, as we describe it, if you can see it on the horizon, um, it's potentially loud enough to uh, mask the whale's ability to echolocate and find their food. And these uh, a massive increase in, in shipping in the inland waters of the Salish Sea. Uh, and then lastly, um, the last of the, the three main identified threats is the exposure to toxicants. So by toxicants, I'm mainly talking about man-made chemicals uh, that are in the marine realm because they've uh, largely made their way there through uh, the out of the terrestrial realm into rivers and then deposited into the marine realm uh, through the uh, rivers that are discharging these, these chemicals. So these are fat loving chemicals. They're called lipophilic toxins or toxicants. And that, that means that they are stored in the fat as long as the animal is getting enough to eat. But as soon as they're not getting enough to eat, they start metabolizing their fat stores for energy. And that's when we get a cascading effect where the vessel presence and associated noise impacts them even more. And the toxicants circulating through their system impacts them even more than they would be if they were getting enough to eat. Um, and so I'll talk more about that um, later in the presentation. So this is the problem. Out of the three main identified threats, and there are others like oil spills, potential oil spills, potential inbreeding. Um, and, but the main, uh, the main biggest threat is the lack of prey. Um, and this is a picture here of sockeye salmon at the turn of the last century. This is representing about 50,000 sockeye salmon that were waiting to be canned. And uh, we humans did a really good job of essentially emptying the oceans of this massive amount of biomass of not just Chinook salmon and not just sockeye salmon, but all species of salmon and many, many, many different uh, other species of fish. We're doing the same thing right now with uh, our, our, um, our forage fish. So um, the whales, uh, salmon, the, the salmon that these whales co-evolved to eat are shrinking uh, and, this, and the whales are starving. So uh, people often ask me like, how can you have this massive apex predator um, that's long lived that only eats fish. And these pictures here uh, answer that question. Um, these whales co-evolved with salmon that in some cases would have been well over a hundred pounds. These fish would have come, the ones on the right would have come out of the Snake River, which is a tributary to the Columbia River. Uh, the Snake River has been in the news quite a lot in the last uh, seven years or so. Um, because of the four Snake River dams that are blocking passage uh, for these fish to get up to some of the coldest water, highest elevation salmon spawning river um, 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 habitat uh, in, the, in the United States and probably honestly in the world. And so the Snake River is very important for the long-term recovery of the Southern residents. We've got to get those dams down in order to be able to um, unblock that passage for the salmon, not just for the whale's sake, certainly, but for the salmon's sake itself. So salmon are declining in abundance and size. 
So I showed you the picture there uh, in the last slide of these fish that are 60, 70, over 100 pounds. Now the average size Chinook salmon for Washington state is 12 and a half pounds. So when you have a, a, an animal as big as a, a killer whale that needs 300 to 450 or so pounds of food per day per whale, um, them trying to find, and especially because they, they are, are prey sharers, they will literally catch a fish and bite it in half so that their family member can have some of it. Um, this is a lot of effort that goes into just meeting their daily caloric needs. And unfortunately, river systems throughout their entire range are in, in jeopardy. You can see here from uh, different colors, from red to orange to, to blue, showing uh, uh, rivers that uh, run, sal Chinook salmon runs that are, that are in trouble. And this picture just quickly, and I'm, I'll try and go fast here because I would like to talk about our research, but in a nutshell, these are rivers. Every one of these colors um, represent a different river within the Southern Residence Range. And so over time, this is coastwide abundance of Chinook salmon by year since the whales started being studied professionally or, or um, uh, officially in 1976, showing these uh, what used to be higher numbers of Chinook salmon. And then in the kind of early 90s, the, the numbers started really overall this, this massive decline. And it, uh, in um, a nutshell, what you're seeing here is when there's high numbers of salmon, there are low numbers of southern resident killer whale deaths. It's staggered by about six months to a year, but essentially when you, these, uh, the purple bar chart at the top is a negative bar chart. So the longer the bar, the more deaths in the Southern resident community. And you can really just see um, quite simply when there's a low numbers of fish, you've got high numbers of deaths in the, in the Southern residents. So what are we doing about that? And what are we trying to, how are we trying to help? We utilize a scat detection dog on the front of our boat uh, who has been trained to sniff out whale feces. Uh, most specifically, we target the southern resident killer whales, but EBA has also been trained on Biggs killer whales. Uh, Biggs killer whales, also known as, uh, formerly known as transient killer whales. Um, we researchers tend to call them uh, mammal eating killer whales uh, in order to be very clear about what they do. Um, so Eva has been trained on mammal eating killer whale feces and now humpback whales. Uh, she's successfully found uh, two humpback whale uh, feces and uh, soon we'll train her on gray whale and minky whale. Although I'm actually not very hopeful that we'll catch minky whale poop because it's very, uh, very hard to find, very watery and diffuse. But we utilize dogs that are often uh, turned into shelters, re uh, surrendered by their owners or found on the streets. These are dogs that are incredibly high play drive motivated. Uh, we don't use food as a reward. These are dogs that want to play more than anything on the planet. And so we couple that desire with um, the scent that we're trying to teach them how to, to find. And um, so we, uh, this is our brand new boat. We just uh, took the program. Wild Orca just uh, assumed responsibility of this long-term project from the University of Washington. So it's entirely run through my nonprofit now. And um, this is what our new boat looks like with Eva at the front and my research partner, Jim, uh, driving and then me on the, on the bow with her reading her behaviors. So uh, training a scat dog is very much like training a, a dog that is uh, meant to find anything from drugs to um, cadavers or um, pretty much anything you can imagine dogs can be trained to find. And so we match that scent in these, uh, this is called box training. We, we put in one of these uh, Petri dishes, the scent that we're trying to train them onto. And then as soon as they walk past that, they get to play. And we do that depending on the dog, it can be anywhere from a day to a, a week or more to really cement that relationship between playtime and that smell. And then once they have it, they, we move it out into the field, ha hide it literally in the middle of a big field where the wind can pick up and, and carry the scent. And the dogs will uh, are amazing at finding it. And then we take it one step farther and hide it, not just from the dog, but the handler so that the, we can uh, limit any accidental bias in us trying to accidentally take the dog right to the sample. We don't need to worry about that. These dogs, once they're at this point, they know what they're, they know their job and they know what to do and they go and find the scat samples. On land, uh, the dogs are, have it easy, I say, because they just get trained to sit at the scent. Uh, the scent is right here. 
and the dog is just trained to sit and wait for the handler to, to catch them, uh, catch up with them and give them their reward of playtime. On the water, it's more challenging because the scent is moving. The scat is moving with the, uh, with the current and with the tide as the tide is a um, ebbing, ebbing or flooding and then also locally occurring currents like little eddies or um, little tiny little uh, river currents uh, that can really move a, move a scat sample pretty quickly. And so what I say is it's like finding a needle in a haystack, but the haystack is moving and so is the needle and so are we. And so it really takes a special dog to have the fortitude to stick with it they don't get to sit. They have to keep working as we work our way into the scent. And this is kind of an idealized setup where you've got whales going from the left of your screen to the right. One of them leaves us a beautiful sample there. You can see in that picture. And then the wind is coming from the top of your screen towards the bottom. And as the wind is coming across the scout sample, it creates this scent cone. And our job is to stay ideally in a perfect setup downwind and to the side of those whales by about 400 or 500 meters. We really don't need to get anywhere near the whales if the water is, is like you see in this photo where it's not what we call poop eating water where it's kind of like meringue um, and, and um, where that can chew up the sample pretty quickly. So the idea is we're watching very closely what the dog is doing as soon as we hit the scent cone uh, the dog will have a change of behavior. You can see here, very relaxed dogs just kind of hanging out with us on the bow versus this behavior where Eva stands up, would get up on her uh, uh, back, uh, back feet, put her front paws on the gunnel and uh, really start just pointing with her nose where we're supposed to, to move the boat. And this is what very amazing, beautiful scout samples look like. These are really thick. They're fatty, they're, they stick together for a long time. You can see this one was so massive, we had to use a full net to scoop it up. Normally we use a, a, a thousand mil beaker attached to the end of a wooden bowel. Um, I, I think I've got a picture later. Um, but these are just beautiful samples that we collected many, many years ago. Now it's often the case where we'll only find, say, something like this, or remarkably something that tiny. Um, we need about a, a mil, a half a mil to a mil of, of scat in order to do our basic sample analysis. The bigger, the better, though, because we want to be able to have enough to keep training and keep uh, practicing with our dog. And so here's a little video of what essentially what Eva is, is working for. This is what she's waiting to have happen. Get it, Eva, get it. Good job. Good girl. So she gets to play for about five minutes after finding a scat sample. And we learned after her first year that she really doesn't even need that Kong, that ball that was attached to the rope. Really, she just wants to play tug uh, and then chew on her rope. So scat can, scat can tell us an incredible amount from uh, about what's happening with the individual, and then we extrapolate that based on a, a, a wide, you know, all of the scat samples that we've collected for the year or even for that month, and then we're able to, to, to say quite a bit about what's happening with the population. And so these are some of the things, just some of the things that we are able to look at with just one scat sample. So we can say we obviously know who it is because we're behind them looking for their poop. Um, but we can also say, um, you know, that it's a killer whale, that it's X individual in the population. So we can track DNA of the, of the, uh, the pooper, if you will. Uh, we can say if it's a female, if she's pregnant and uh, not only if she's pregnant, but how pregnant. Uh, stress hormone levels, nutrition levels, toxicant levels of all kinds, different toxicants. Um, we can say uh, different diseases that they might have. We can look for parasites. Um, we're also starting to move into a very exciting field of being able to determine prey genetics. So that's uh, going to be very important for us to be able to tell um, uh, elected officials and um, in your country, as well as our country, exactly what runs of salmon are the most important, or at least what the runs of salmon the whales are eating at that time. And that's going to be very, very helpful. 
Um, also, you know, fungus microbiome, what's happening in their gut, and um, things like antibiotic resistant bacteria can also be found from scat. So our findings to date, 69% uh, of Southern resident killer whale females who are getting pregnant are losing those babies either to spontaneous miscarriage because they're not getting enough to eat, or the babies might be born and die right away as we had in 2018 with the death of uh, J35's uh, daughter, female calf who died uh, just minutes after being born. And then uh, probably you saw J35 carrying around her dead infant uh, for 17 days. Um, we can look at the, uh, uh, by, by looking at that scat sample, we can see when they're not getting enough to eat, we can see the amplification of toxicants in their feces. So again, as they're not getting enough to eat every day, they metabolize their fat stores that releases those toxicants into their system, which causes, um, it could potentially be causing birth defects. It could be causing um, uh, reproductive hormone problems like sterility, um, uh, many, many, many different things. Certainly these toxicants, when they're circulating through the whale system are making them more prone to disease and early death. And so I just I love this picture. I want to uh, kind of leave you with this. I think this is one of my last slides. Um, this is an amazing picture of uh, people often think this is a, a mother uh, a calf pair. These are actually brothers. J27 is the big male in the back. His name is Blackberry. And his little brother, J39, is Mako. And this was a couple of years after their mom, uh, J11, Blossom, died. And J27 took over foraging for his family because his sister um, was not old enough to be uh, take over that leadership role for that family. And J27 really stepped in and kept that family together. J37, their sister, has recently had a calf of her own, which is just amazing. And so I love this picture because it, it reminds me um, to remind people that uh, when we lose the thought of losing this animal, these animals are just, it's too heartbreaking to even consider. Um, you know, we can, we at Wild Orca consider these whales to be the original harvesters of Pacific salmon. They've been foraging on these salmon uh, throughout the entire west coast of the US and BC Canada for hundreds of thousands of years. And they really did co evolve in salmon nation. And so um, to lose these whales is just not, not an option as far as we're concerned. So we could not do this work without our amazing volunteers and our crew. Uh, we're woefully underfunded like many uh, nonprofits are. And we are able to do a lot of our work because we have uh, unpaid volunteers that come out and, and do everything from help us play with Eba when she's found a sample to scooping poop, helping us process uh, the samples and uh, cleaning up after a, a sample collection. And our current amazing supporter, the Rose Foundation, this is money that was actually um, set aside with the Cook Aquaculture debacle back in 2017. I'm, uh, maybe some of you heard about that with the massive collapse of a fish farm here in the Salish Sea off of Cypress Island uh, near uh, our mainland, uh, Anacortes. And um, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Atlantic, non-native Atlantic salmon were released uh, uh, with that catastrophic net failure. And the Cook Aquaculture settled a lawsuit um, out of court uh, to um, help fund uh, um, salmon research and killer whale research. And those funds are uh, distributed through the Rose Foundation. We've also had funding in the past from the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation and those other funders down there at the bottom. So I think I'll end there. I had some questions, but we're going over, I do believe. So I'll stop there and um, answer questions if anybody has any. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Giles. That was so informative. Um, I'll turn it over to our audience. Um, if you'd like to raise your hand and unmute yourself, that would be great. We'd be happy to, we have definitely some time for questions. Okay, Alicia, please go ahead. Thank you for that most amazing presentation. Um, I especially love that last picture with the two brothers. Um, it's, uh, it helps illuminate that other species have emotional and relationship attachments and social structure. 
um, that sometimes it's hard for humans to recognize that. So I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to ask a question and it's, it's really big, but what would you see within our Pacific coast um, stretch of area? What do you see as a fundamental gap that certain people in certain positions might be able you know, to add some energy to? Um, I think um, the, the biggest gap uh, in understanding about how uh, to recover this population of killer whales, and when I talk about recovering killer whales, that's, um, you know, they're, they're an, uh, an umbrella species. So when we talk about recovering them, if we're successful at that, it means that we've been successful at um, fixing a lot of other problems that would be required in order to have a recovering and healthy population of, of southern resident killer whales. So the, the biggest disconnect that I see is, is that the way that fisheries are managed in the US and Canada and in the world for that matter, are done um, from the human perspective and with humans in mind. The fisheries management is not done from the perspective of a salmon. And what I mean by that is we have uh, artificially carved up uh, the, the, the marine realm in ways that don't make sense from a biological standpoint. So we have these fisheries management councils that, um, that split up the, the ocean um, and uh, in a way that doesn't make sense. So we've got the, the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council, which is responsible for Alaska. Mm -hmm. And then we have the Pacific Fisheries Management Council, which is responsible for BC, Canada, Washington and most of Oregon. Um, the problem is, is that these fish exit their natal river, no matter where they're from. Uh, uh, they, some of them may stay very local. We call those here black mouth. They don't, they don't really leave the, the, um, the, the, and go out into the open ocean. But for the most part, fish leave their natal river, go to the, the, to the um, ocean and hang a right and go up to, to Alaska. They go up there to feed on that incredibly rich, nutrient-rich cold water in the, that cold water, um, and uh, they spend anywhere from two, three, four, five years in Alaska getting big before making their way back to their natal river. The problem is, is that the vast, vast, vast majority, for example, 97% of fish caught in Alaska is not native to Alaska. Those are fish that were born in BC rivers, uh, Washington rivers, and Oregon rivers. And yet they get that stamp of approval called Alaskan caught wild Chinook salmon. It's a generic term that is technically true because they were caught in Alaska, but they're not native to Alaska. And so what that has done is it creates a confusion for the consumer my, my uh, uh, ugly joke is, is that it was some marketing genius's idea to brand them in that way, to call them Alaskan caught wild Chinook salmon and, and tell consumers that if you eat Alaskan caught wild Chinook salmon, you're eating a, a sustainably harvested fish. That is not the case. Only 3% of fish caught in Alaska is native to Alaska where we might be able to say that that fish is caught sustainably. And so people say, oh my gosh, how can you know? You know, because if it's caught, if it is a sustainably harvested uh, uh, salmon that was born in Alaska and died in Alaska, it's going to have the name of the river attached to it. And so for example, you'll see in the shelves, uh, um, Copper River Chinook salmon, or right now, um, Copper River Sockeye salmon. Um, last July at, in, in Seattle at Pike Place Market, just a, throw it out there as a, a random question, wild caught, the first of the spring wild caught Chinook salmon, how much do you think a pound of that salmon was? So it's got its name, Copper River Chinook salmon. It is wild, it was wild caught, and it's been flown down here. That's not factored into the price though. Uh, the, the flight is not factored into the price. Get, take, somebody wager a guess on how much you think that was per pound. Five dollars. Three dollars. No, way up. Someone says twenty-five in the chat. 
it was $80 a pound. Oh That's how you know it's a sustainably harvested salmon because it actually cost what it should cost. Right next to it, in the ice right next to it, is a fish that's called wild caught Chinook salmon, Alaskan caught wild Chinook salmon, and that was $12 a pound. Mm -hmm. That I can almost 97% or, you know, how much, there's 19, at least 19 runs of Chinook salmon that are on the endangered species list, either as uh, runs of concern, uh, uh, endangered or threatened. So I almost can guarantee you that that $15 a pound salmon is not sustainably harvested. And yet the consumer is never going to know that. Mm -hmm. This, in my opinion, is the biggest travesty and why we have been so unsuccessful in recovering Chinook salmon, any species of salmon for that matter, but Chinook in particular, is because of the way fisheries management is done. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting point you bring up because we also don't have the same labeling requirements here in Canada for a lot of our fish as well, like when you're seeing it in markets. So yeah, it's a really interesting thing to think about. Mm -hmm. um, Betty, I see that you have a question. Would you like to unmute yourself? Um, I'm just going to go tangentially. I'm a dog lover and I used to have <laughs> a dog that would accompany me in my canoe wherever I went. How did you stumble upon the idea of using a land animal like dogs? Uh, are you quite innovative with respect to using dogs to identify water-based scat? Uh, or did you pick up on someone else's research? I think that this is a link to a much larger public who are land-based and dog lovers who don't understand the connection between what your research is with dogs and whales. Um, so Dr. Wasser, who started the Whale Scout Project um, uh, here in the Salish Sea uh, and has just transferred the program to me as of this year, um, I started working for that for the Center for Conservation Biology and Dr. Wasser in 2009. So I, I am not the innovator of this, of this technique. Dr. Wasser and uh, Roz Rowland and um, Barb uh, Davenport were the original brain children behind this idea of using scat detection dogs in the marine realm. Sam had been using scat dogs on terrestrial animals um, since 1997. And then uh, by about uh, 2000, well, right around 9-11, uh, they were in the midst of piloting um, using dogs, scent detection dogs in the marine realm to find North Atlantic right whale feces, an incredibly, another incredibly endangered population of, of, of whales. Um, and they used a Rottweiler um, on the front of a, a boat in the, in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and uh, they were able to, to um, discern easily enough that the dog was in fact able to utilize wind as long as the driver of the vessel was, was operating properly um, and essentially putting the dog downwind at a 90 degree angle of where that scat, scat, scat sample would have been left behind. The dog, as soon as they knew what they were looking for, they would have a change of behavior. And so um, that's very different though than what we ended up try piloting um, in 2008 and 2009, because um, number one, nobody had really ever paid attention to killer whale scat. We didn't know what it looked like. Um, we knew that it wasn't going to look like North Atlantic right whale poop or even, even humpback poop, which is um, incredibly massive, incredibly stinky, bright red, oily, stays at the surface for a long, long time, and you can see it from an airplane. Uh, killer whale scat, as you saw in my photos, can be tiny, you know, that's a big scat sample for us. It can be the size of your pinky nail and the dog can find it. And so it's an, it is an incredibly interesting um, way to study animals in the marine realm non-invasively if you have everything else going for you. So we did some consulting recently, uh, teaching some folks in Hawaii uh, to utilize a dog um, on the front of their boat to try and find spinner dolphin and um, uh, false killer whale, and I think maybe um, bottlenose dolphin in Hawaii um, using scent detection dogs. I'm, I, um, I am really hopeful. I'm crossing my fingers for them. They are, their marine realm is more challenging than ours is here in the Salish Sea. They get winds that uh, essentially mean that they, they can go out first thing in the morning and they have to be back on land by, by um, 
lunchtime, oftentimes during, uh, during when the whales, when the animals are present because the wind kicks up so heavily. And it's just, it's not worth it to even try because a dog will, will get a scent and will try and turn in. And if the wind and the water is moving too fast, you just end up frustrating the heck out of the dog. And so you have to have the proper uh, uh, marine conditions. Um, so uh, enough wind to pick up the scent and carry it to the dog, but not enough wind or wave action to, to frustrate the dog um, where they can't find it because we can't get to it fast enough. Well, I think that you've got a Reader's Digest multiplier effect when you add the dogs into the whales. There are many land lovers who love dogs and would the link with the whales. Your identification with the whales family is so powerful. But when we put the dogs with it, I can't imagine you not getting millions of dollars for research. <laughs> You know, it's, it's very strange. It, it truly is. I mean, I, I'm honestly quite perplexed by the whole thing as well. Part of it, I think, is that we're a fairly well-known organization. Um, and I think that people think we're well-funded. We have high, we, we're high profile. Uh, if you look at our website, wildorca.org, there's a, a video that came out at the end of last year. It has David Attenborough um, uh, narrating it. Uh, it was, uh, it was funded by, um, Prince, Will, uh, Prince William uh, for his Earthshot Prize uh, program. Um, the, earlier in the year we had, it was on Netflix and Uma Thurman, a, an actress named Uma Thurman was the, you know, uh, younger people than me know who she is, but um, she, uh, she was a narrator for, uh, I'm sorry, she was the narrator for a PBS program. We had Netflix with this other gentleman, uh, Yasser Nassif or something. Again, young people know who that is. Um, we were on Disney Plus with Bill Farmer, who has been the voice of Goofy and Pluto for 35 years. They did a wonderful program called uh, It's a Dog's Life. And Eva was the very first episode that they aired. None of that has ever yielded any, any, finance, in, in any money to us. Mm -hmm. What it has done is raised our profile and given a, us an opportunity, like right now, for me to tell you guys, mm -hmm. go to our website and watch the program with David Attenborough narrating it and, you know, being able to broadcast our program in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, quite honestly, it's, it's shocking that we're not, that we're not turning money away because of the, in the non-invasive nature in which we can do this work because we use the superpower that is the dog's nose. Mm -hmm. Incredible. We wish you the best so of luck. Much. Um, we have a question from Kathy Haig as well. Go ahead, Kathy. Yeah, I'm just curious while you're out there in the boats, you're following the whales. How long does it take to find a poop sample? Like how frequently do they defecate? Um, in a perfect world, they're eating every day and they're getting their full caloric needs. And so they're pooping not infrequently. Um, maybe once a day, maybe twice a day. We don't really know for sure, but say captive animals uh, uh, poop once or twice a day. There are days that there's no scat, they're not pooping. They're just not getting enough to eat. Um, the other day when J-Pod was near here, we got uh, one one day, none the next day, one the day, the next day, six the next day. And so um, it's just, it varies. Um, it varies depending on how much the whale, just like you and me, if we're not eating, we're not pooping. Um, we used to have a, we, we used to have kind of a tongue in cheek bumper sticker that we gave away, uh, sold as a fundraiser um, that said, everybody loves a pooping whale. Um, because if you have a pooping whale, it means you have an, a whale that's eating. And if you have a whale that's eating, the, the likelihood that that animal is healthier is, is higher. And so um, I'm trying to get my director to, to sanction another printing of that bumper sticker because I, I think it's hilarious and it's true. So th there's no, there's no, um, no hard fast rule to, to, to how often they poop. Great, we would, I think we would uh, collectively love a round of those stickers. So keep us in mind if you do another reprint. Okay. Um, I had a question. So I had a prof of mine and he did um, terrestrial scat detection with dogs. And he had a preference for certain kinds of dogs, like certain breeds. And I was wondering if that's something that's shown up for you folks, or if you haven't gotten that selective with it. Um, what was he detecting? 
Uh, he was looking at a bunch of um, terrestrial species in Nova Scotia. So he did a lot of reptiles. So he did snakes and turtles, all endangered species. I believe they were also looking at a couple different mammals as well. But I remember he mentioned that he loved to have dogs that were part border collie, but never full border collie because they're like very work motivated and very quick to learn. But if you're their full border collie, they're a little too um, mm -hmm. intense you will <laughs> yeah we do not we are not breed specific at all in fact our eba is probably part pitbull and uh jack russell or corgi even <laughs> i have no idea she looks corgi to me mm -hmm. um we, we've heard pitbull we've never had her tested um our arguably most famous dog was black lab and probably pitbull most of our dogs are street dogs and most uh, most street dogs are part pitbull Mm -hmm. um, I find their temperament to be excellent, but we've had, uh, full, we've had, um, you know, Jack Russell, um, um, Chihuahua mix, <laughs> uh, we've had, uh, a Whippet, we've had all kinds of different lab mixes. Um, for us, it's dogs that are, like I mentioned, they, they're often, uh, relinquished to shelters because they're incredibly high play drive. And uh, uh, oftentimes they, they, until they're given a job, sometimes they actually don't make good companion animals. Once they know they're going to have a job and they've, they've got something to do and you know how to direct their attention and their energy, um, that nine times out of 10, they become very bonded uh, with their crew, with their handler and with their larger crew. And, um, and they, they turn out to be incredible um, companion animals as well as scent detection dogs. But uh, to answer your question in the short, no, we would take any dog that's highly uh, motivated. What I will say with the whale program is, is that our dogs prior to Eba were bigger dogs. And I actually think her smaller, slightly smaller stature and her stockiness um, and, you know, her low center of gravity is actually really good for a boat because she doesn't get thrown around in the same way that our longer legged dogs were. And also when she's leaning over the bow, um, she's kind of more on her legs and not leaning on her chest. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that one of our larger dogs may have, I don't know, it, he might've been prone to it anyway, but he ended up getting quite stiff in his age and his, in his shoulders. And I, I've often wondered whether or not that was because he was leaning over the front of the bow um, as much as he did. And so um, I would just say it's more about you know, you're not going to put a chihuahua on a, on a, on a uh, caribou uh, samples because oftentimes we find those caribou or wolverine or wolf samples under several feet of snow, for example. And so you wouldn't put a chihuahua on that, but I'm, I'm not unconvinced that they wouldn't be able to find it. I'm sure that they would be. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, I think that takes us to time, Kayla. Is that correct? Anyways, we wanted to give you a big thank you, Dr. Giles. So thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure to learn from you today. Um, so thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your research and keep it up. I know that the funding struggle is hard, but I'm I, I keep my fingers crossed that you guys find a good stable source of funding and you're able to continue your wonderful work. Thank you. Thank you. And just one more plug for wildorca.org. Go and check us out and uh, watch that video. We are going to be putting that on our social media as well and out in our next newsletter as a wrap up to this AGM. So it will, wow. we'll go out to our, our, our membership and newsletter readers. That was Great. fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Good night, folks. Yes, so thank Good night. You. Thank you for joining Perfect. us. Awesome. So I'm just going to put out um, a quick call for questions or comments based on the Project Watershed content tonight. If anybody had follow-up questions for us, um, please let me know. I'll give a couple minutes for that. Um, yes, Betty, I saw that you put your hand up. Yeah, I did. Um, I, I, in listening to both presentations tonight, one thing comes through that always comes through on fascinating observing science projects. And that is, you, we get so wrapped up in the funding exercise and the implementation exercise and the accountability exercise, we forget and don't do so well on communications. Mm -hmm. I am being asked all the time, I live on the Riverway, all the time people are asking me, people don't understand the recycling you talked about so easily. And I think a signboard 
um, along the Kuskinsum site that kind of is a progress chart. Uh, doesn't have to be really expensive. It could somehow be changed. I'm sure that there are materials to do it. It's it's you've got public interest. You got you had the public interest with the fundraising, and you want to continue with it. I just feel that there's very little information that's getting out about what's that you what you just provided us with. This is what we did this year. This is what we're going to do next year. Here's the multi-layered effect of it. Um, and here's how we're re recycling. That just isn't getting out enough, in my opinion. So, you know, it's not like you don't have anything to do. But that's my suggestion from this year's AGM. You're doing wonderful work. We still need to find ways to get it out there to wider public who do support us, who don't understand and who need to be educated eternally there's so many new people in the valley they don't have a clue that that was once even a sawmill great well thank you so much for your feedback betty i think we're looking we're exploring like where that placement can be with the partner group so i have a meeting with them on monday and i'll just reiterate the importance and see what we can do best wishes for success <laughs> thank you great any other questions or comments before we um wrap things up Great. Well, I just wanted to give a big thank you to everyone and uh, a big uh, excited shout out to our board members who are once again going to lead us into another successful year. So thank you for all your leadership. It has been a wonderful learning curve for me to work with all of you. So thank you so much for all the time and energy you put into this organization and into making this work possible. Um, thank you, Kayla, for organizing this event for us. Always appreciated. And as always, thank you to our members and our volunteers. We wouldn't be where we are without all of you. So a big thank you to everyone here today. Thank you so much for joining us. This was recorded. So if you, if you would like to come back and review some of the content, please let us know and we can post the recording. Just a final note, a plug for our next one of these. So on June 16th uh, in the evening, we have another uh, Zoom event where we'll be talking about couscousum and exactly what we said, Betty, explaining what's going to be happening this year and giving people more details. I believe Caitlin and Jennifer will be hosting that and it should be really informative. It's gonna be so fun. And yeah, we're gonna dive a lot deeper into the planning for year two which is this year. So a lot of the stuff we didn't get to talk about today because we were looking back at last year, we'll be looking forward at year two and what we'll be seeing for this summer at Peace Be Some. We need a dog. People can come and meet the dog. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. We so appreciate all of you. So thank you so much for coming out and continuing to support our work. Thank Have a great you, night, everyone. You too, thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, that was great. Bye.